Okay, I'm going to talk about some spoilery things. I'm going to talk a lot about Star Trek fan films, so I guess I will issue myself a... Eh? Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the Fandai Master. And that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about a half an hour early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the century that came before. And you discover there isn't much that's new in the world, which is why watching both uh, the Orville and Doctor Who, my spoiler review said that that kicked in and I saw stuff coming, uh, particularly when it comes to what people are probably going to call um, uh, the relationship between uh, Ed and, and all that. God, I hope they don't do what I see coming. I really hope they don't. Larry asks, where and how do you get the despecialized editions? I would check a bit torrent. Um, they pop up there from time to time. It's a search now. It is a search now. Uh, definitely check BitTorrent. Uh, ThePirateBay.org immediately comes to mind. is a good place to look for that. It's where I find my Doctor Who. Which, by the way, I have now seen and done a non-spoiler review of, despite the fact that most of my brethren here in North America will not have seen that. BitTorrent! <clears throat> Excuse me. So, other things I'm going to talk about. Star Trek Axanar. Holy for holies. Here's one that I never expected to see ever again. <laughs> this one came back from the dead. I thought it was gone. I uh, certainly recommend watching Prelude to Axanar. There is a link to it on my website because I don't dare put too many links in the description box below. And anyway, I don't want to muddle up, you know, muddy up where what the links are that you should go to for the, for the, for the charity. Um, Prelude to Axanar, if you don't know, brilliant, brilliant fan film was scheduled to go as an actual two-hour um, motion picture fan film, but uh, they got into a fight with Paramount about it, and um, basically that's what triggered Paramount CBS doing the fan film rules that basically killed fan films. Um, I think that CBS Paramount would have done it anyway, but Axnar had no legal standing and never did, and uh, they were going to lose that one. Now, CBS did eventually settle up. Um, they just settled out of court. And in so doing, and this is how Axnar is now coming back from the dead, in so doing, they gave them uh, you know, the same rules. You can do 15-minute episodes. And so they're going to do two 15-minute episodes. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I am certainly excited for it. I'm way more excited for Axanar than I am for Discovery. Even though it's hitting about the same time period, I'm far more interested in Axanar than Discovery. So good on them for uh, being able to bring that sucker back from the dead. Um, I'm very, very anxious to see it. Larry Larry says, uh, BBC America will show Doctor Who in half an hour. Yeah, I thought that was probably the case. I thought that was probably the case. So if you're watching my show, well, from the beginning, you got to see a non-spoiler review of something that my brethren here in North America, unless they've done as I have done and found a screener shortly after the fact, have not yet seen. And in any case, I suggest finding a screener because BBC America will yank out randomly Anywhere from you know 15 to 10 minutes to 15 minutes worth of episode. We'll just yank the pieces out so they can fit commercials in. I've seen them do it. It sucks. It really sucks. I'm also going to talk about a couple of other things here. I want to talk about Star Trek Continues. Because I have already reviewed all of the Star Trek Continues episodes. Unfortunately, for community guidelines reasons, YouTube took them all down along with the other 300 videos that made up my channel. And I can't put them back up. Amazingly enough, I've tried, and amazingly enough, YouTube is keeping some kind of record about what they've taken down, and they will not allow me to put any up. The moment that I do, 
It risks a community guideline strike. It is rejected instantly after it's done uploading and risks community guideline strikes. So I pull them down, not even trying. I'm now going to put all that stuff over on the Internet Archive, which is way more complicated than it sounds. Um, Internet Archive has some very specific things that you have to do in order to make things look good when you do the uploads. They'll get there eventually. It's the only place that I can think of that is even going to remotely be safe. And as it is, Internet Archive is well overdue for a serious, serious copyright issue. You can find some of the films, commercial films, that I review out there. There's at least one copy of Superman the movie out there. Um, they also have a lot of copyrighted software that I've seen out there that is current, new software that people put up. So I think they're cruising for a bruising when it comes to uh, copyrights. We'll see, but at the moment, they appear to be the only relatively safe place to put these, that they won't be pulled down. So talking about Star Trek continues in a more general way, um, you know, looking back now, it's been, I don't know, six months or so since I stopped, I finished those, those reviews. Um, if you haven't watched them, by the way, this is spoiler, so if you haven't watched them, go out and watch them. Star Trek Continues is an awesome show. Uh, there is a playlist that I have. Again, you have to go to my website to see it because I don't want to get community guidelines, strikes, but there's a playlist that I have here. You can probably find it if you go to my playlists. I have a playlist here that shows all of those episodes in chronological order. My website has no links to my archived reviews yet. Yes, they don't, because those archived reviews are not appearing anywhere as of this moment. Uh, it is a lot harder than you think to put stuff up on Internet Archive. It'll be worth it, but it's going to take time. <laughs> Vicinity of 300 videos, man. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot that's going to go up there. But Star Trek continues. Uh, go watch it if you haven't. It's a great show. Looking back, you know, after having reviewed them all and looking back at it, kind of a look back from, you know, this point in time. Uh, it is a great show. <laughs> it is a great show that in many, many ways blew my fracking socks off. Um, the episodes that really stick out in my mind are uh, Lolani, because I think that's a really well put together episode. It's very well done. Good script. And Lou Ferrigno as uh, an Orion is great. You know, he's all green like he was with the Incredible Hulk. But the amazing thing is, Lou Ferrigno can actually act. He's deaf, but and his speech impediment is okay. It works for this character. Uh, I'm not sure if you didn't know that he was deaf, if you wouldn't think he was uh, just sort of speech impediment. Um, but he works well in that. I think that's a very moving episode. like it a lot from a number of perspectives. Uh, Larry says they had set tours for a while. Yeah, um, Star Trek New Voyages does do set tours still, so yeah. <clears throat> but again, looking back at it, the ones that really stick out in my mind are Lolani. And I've forgotten the name of the episode where they went back and they asked the question. They answered the question that fans had sometimes asked. What happened in Mirror Mirror right after Kirk beamed back, after evil Kirk beamed back? What happened? And they answer that question rather nicely. They answer the question rather well. Um, and in so doing, they recreate everything about Mirror Mirror that everybody tended to love. Plus, they showed us this evil Kirk we hadn't seen before, which was a lot of fun. That one sticks out in my mind. And, of course, the last two episodes, the two-parter to Boldly Go, completely stick out in my mind for many, many reasons. What modern fans have to realize is we never got a series finale for Star Trek because they almost never did that back in the 60s. There's maybe one or two TV shows. I, the one that immediately comes to mind is uh, The Fugitive. There was a series finale for The Fugitive. But most of the time on American television, your ratings went down, the network called and said, okay, you're done, no more show next year. And that was that. You didn't have the opportunity to do a series finale on most of them. So what Vic Mignogna did with the To Boldly Go was to give us the series finale that we never saw. And in so doing, he was able to insert that into canon. Now, Star Trek continues is not canon from the perspective that anybody working on Star Trek thinks of it as such. 
but it's part of my personal canon because everything that happens in there would fit into the rest of the timeline. There's nothing that happens there that wouldn't fit. And in fact, it fits really well in one case when uh, Spock goes back to Vulcan and why he does the colonar, that makes total sense. It sets it up properly and it works perfectly in the context of larger canon. So not only did he give us the series finale that we never had, not only did he set it up so that it fits perfectly so we can say, okay, the next adventure we're going to see with them is a Star Trek The Motion Picture. And it fits canonically in there. But in addition to juggling all that, he also gave us everything that Star, Wars, Star Trek fans of that era had always wanted to see happen again. We got the return of the Romulan commander, something that Star Trek fans had wanted and wanted and wanted. We had a saucer separation, which, if it had occurred in the 1960s, would have been completely unique. Now it's not such a big deal, but back then, very, very unique. And it was something that we had always wanted to see. But for me, the biggest thing about those is two things. The biggest thing is that, intentionally or not, and I would really like to talk to Vic Mignogna asking this, intentionally or not, in my opinion, they created a series-long arc for Star Trek that had not existed before. You know, usually when you walk away from a TV series where you have, you know, as they do today, with arcs that reach, the, you know, cover a season, cover a whole series, you can look back at it and you say, what was that show about? What was that show about? Previously, the answer for Star Trek is it was about some people boldly going where no man had gone before doing one-and-done episodes with occasional character development that would bleed up into future episodes. But mostly just one-and-done. That was what Star Trek, the original series, was. But by taking us and giving us both the ability to see, again, you know, those espers from the very first episode as part of the very last episode, and the most important thing about that was Lieutenant Smith, because, in fact, she is... That character is in that first episode of Star Trek, where no man has gone before. She is, in fact, on that bridge and holding Gary Mitchell's hand when he turns into, um, you know, yet another godlike alien. Which, at that time, the first episode was not yet another godlike alien. It was just a godlike alien. Well, godlike guy in his case. But by putting that character in, it cemented the arc. And um, Kipley Brown, who played the character Smith in, Nick, in uh, New Voyages. I cannot stress enough how much I like her performance on a number of levels. But for me, the moment that she walks into the uh, engine room on the USS Hood, just kind of stalks in there, does her thing, and then realizes, oh, I'm going to have to blow myself up. Um, that is all wonderful stuff. That is really wonderful stuff that very much helps sells, uh, sell the, uh, the whole episode, frankly. I frankly found her sacrifice more interesting than not being able to get Dr. McKenna back. I understand that had a big impact on Spock, but dramatically for me, I get a bigger kick. If I want to watch that episode, I just put it to that moment when she's walking into this engine room and, uh, you know, she does a thing, one thing with her hand, the guys are gone, she's doing a thing, she gets hit, guys are gone again, she's got elect It's I love it. I love her performance there and I think it's great. And it totally sells um, this ending and also sells the series long arc that intentionally or not, I believe, was laid down because of that episode. Star Trek, when you get that as a bookend, you know, when you have starting out with these espers who will be turned into Yaglas and ending with these espers who turn into Yaglas, you're to me, putting an arc on the entire series that did not previously exist. I think that what you've done, intentionally or not, is you have started to be able to answer the question, what was Star Trek the original series about? In the 1990s, fans, uh, and I, was, I knew some of them, had made a calculation that in general with Star Trek, and certainly with Star Trek the original series, roughly 25% of all stories involve godlike aliens. 25%. That is a lot. And it's not surprising. It was one of Roddenberry's beloved ideas. Um, he did it in Star Trek The Motion Picture. 
And he did it throughout the series quite a lot. And when you look at it, you know, as a fan, you say, wow, 25%, damn, that's a hell of a lot. I'd be using a plot device. But um, once you take this and you put it at the end, you book at it at the end, I think you answer the question, what is Star Trek, the original series, about? For the most part, Star Trek, the original series, is about people and how, they, how human beings react when they are pitted or meet godlike aliens. That's really, when you think about all the stories they did in the context of now having these bookends and this character of Smith who's kind of run through this, that's for me what Star Trek becomes about. The answer to the question, what is Star Trek the original series about, becomes it is about human beings and how they react to becoming involved with godlike alien characters. Now, it may be that ultimately this was a reuse of an idea that Gene Roddenberry just happened to like a lot. But again, by bookending it the way that they did, I think it lays down, intentionally or not, an arc that makes more sense for Star Trek. So when somebody asks you, what was the original series about exactly? You say, the original series was about human beings and how they react when they are presented with aliens that are so advanced that they might as well be godlike. And, and I have to hand it to Vic, whether you intended that or not, Vic, damn. You know, when I first saw it, I was completely blown away by that whole notion that you had, intentionally or not, laid down a series arc for Star Trek that did not previously exist. I mean, it was kind of there, but doing that, bookending it, really threw it in sharp relief, for me, anyway. So thank you very much, Vic, for having done that. It makes it so easy for me now when people ask me what is Star Trek, the original series, about. I can see it's about human beings and how they react to finding godlike aliens all over the place. So thank you, Vic, for that. Thank you for giving us that series finale that we never saw and never would have seen. Uh, had it not been for the extraordinary creativity, the talent, and the amount of effort that making that must have been. I know it's a labor of love, but damn. You know, that last episode alone, they were all great. They were all great. Don't get me wrong. There isn't a single one of those episodes I dislike. Some of them I like better than others. But there's no episode of Star Trek Continues that I dislike. But that last episode, my God. You know, and the Romulan commander. God, I got chills, you know. She looks so much. The actress who plays her is the, is the daughter of the one who played her in the original series. She looks so much like her mother that I got chills. When she showed up on the view screen, I got chills. I was like, oh, my God, I have stepped back into the past. Um, you know, so all of that was great. All of that was really, really good. Um, we got to find out what the disposition of all those other uh, Starfleet ships really were, which is going to be interesting considering what I'm going to do for my next fan film reviews. But again, thank you, Vic Mignogna, if you happen to be watching. Awesome, awesome show all around. Lolani in particular just blows me away. Um, and the last episode, uh, last two episodes, Too Bold to Go. Wonderful, wonderful episodes. Vic Mignogna, you have put an arc into Star Trek, the original series, that did not exist. And you did it with a wonderful actress, Ghibli Brown, who I think sells the whole thing. <laughs> I think she completely sells it. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Vic Mignogna. Other Star Trek uh, fan films I can talk about this time around. I'm going to talk about Star Trek Horizon. Um... Now, again, I've got a link to this on my website. If you go there and you go to the part that's got the sidebar that says, you know, charity live stream, bottom of the page, I have a link to, a, uh, to this film, to Star Trek uh, Horizon. It is, again, a movie that I have reviewed and has been pulled off of YouTube and will show up someday over on the Internet Archive. But uh, I, I, just a few words about it because it's so interesting. It is uh, basically a two-hour movie but is a love letter where, where Star Trek dis continues, is a love letter to original series fans like myself. Star Trek Horizon is very much a love letter to Enterprise fans. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of like, meanwhile, in this slightly other part of the same universe, um, there's this other starship and other things are going on. And again, like um, Star Trek Continues, it had the benefit of hindsight so they could fit it into the chronology um, and can canonicity if they wanted to. Um, again, this is one of those films that for me is part of my own personal canon, because why not? It doesn't uh, contradict anything. It is situated in the appropriate place, works really well, very good film. Um, little things on that that just kind of blow me away uh, are like when they're down on the uh, alien planet and everything's kind of purple. It's, it's generally just a purple filter. I get that and a bunch of special effects added afterwards. But still, um, really cool. Um, we don't usually see that many planets in Star Trek that are really, really alien. You know, the, uh, one of the things I liked about um, Star Trek Into Darkness was the beginning where they're on that very alien planet, has a different look to it, has a lot of very alien looking plants and stuff like that. Don't see that a lot in traditional Star Trek. They shoot, you know, they always have shot with some limitations about where they can go for this sort of thing. So most of the time, alien planets tend to look very Earth-like. But the simple addition of a rather reddish filter and some CGI on the backgrounds, and suddenly we had a rather cool little alien planet. Um, so I like that a lot. And it wasn't the only thing I liked. I think it's a great script. I think it is a good movie all the way around. You should definitely go and check that one out. Star Trek Horizon is a very, very good fan film. There is Star Trek of Gods and Men. And uh, that one, again, a very, very, very good fan film. Uh, that one, they... They got characters from the original series. I mean, Nichelle Nichols plays Uhura and uh, plays her more and with more depth than we ever saw Uhura get a chance to have on the original series. They also got characters and actors from other Star Trek. Uh, Voyager immediately comes to mind in terms of some of the people they got. And uh, some of them have more to do there than they did in Voyager. <laughs> I'm kind of sad that those guys then went on later to do... Um, that J.M.U. Schulman film. But in any case, they got some uh, good actors. They, got, uh, the, they, they took a piece or two from the Star Trek original series Mythos and sort of combined them, turned them into something that you know was, in fact, pretty terrifying. Um, so good film all the way around. I had good things to say about it when I reviewed it, and now it's gone. Um, but good film all the way around. Liked it very much. Uh, not the love letter, that continues or horizon were to various types of fans, but still a really well made. And of course, they use the uh, sets from Star Trek Phase Two, uh, New Voyages, so it looks great all the way around. It is, a, you know, and they did this. They did this, which I get a kick out of. They recreated the um, Guardian of Forever, but at the um, uh, God, why am I blanking on it? The uh, Vasquez Rocks which uh, Kirk rather famously fought the Gorn in. Um, so I get a kick out of that. I get a kick out of the fact that they do a lot of location shooting there, which is very cool, as opposed to being on a soundstage someplace. I, I even got a kick out of this. You know, the, the uh, Guardian of Forever um, was originally shot on a soundstage. You know, there wasn't much around or behind it. It didn't look, you know, look kind of like a soundstage, to be honest. But here, I like what they've done this. They actually did a replica, put it out there in the Vasquez Rocks. So, yay for them. Did a good job. Other fan films. Oh, by the way, um, wish my, uh, this is a five-hour charity live stream for uh, the Paradise Strong Fire and Relief GoFundMe. You can find that at GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, one word, dash fire, dash relief. That is www.gofundme.com slash Paradise Strong dash fire dash relief. It is the first link in my description box, and it does scroll past from time to time. And if you need me to, hell, I'll post the link into the chat if you think that's appropriate. Um, one thing I'd mention, of course, it is uh, tax deductible. And every penny that you spend for them is going to go towards victims. They are not holding any back for their own infrastructure um, or their own stuff. Every penny is going to go to those uh, victims. 
And I mention again, I mention again because it's a decent place to break for it. I mention again what I did at the beginning of the episode. Um, you know, I'm doing this for a number of reasons. One, because one of my regular viewers has a close family relative who was from Paradise, and so this particular um, charity is designed hopefully to hit that person. Beyond that, there's who we are as science fiction fans and how we have always been there to help them. Another fan up when they're down. We got one down. Time to help them up. But there's also the fact, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have an obligation. For help I once received, I must in turn help ten others, each of whom will then help ten others, so that good deeds will spread out like ripples from a pebble in a pond. And yes, that came out of an episode of Kung Fu, but it actually happened to me. <laughs> And if you decide that you would like to take on the obligation, then you will become one of my ten. Because I, you're not obliged to. I haven't done you a good deed. But if you want to take it on of your own accord, well, then you become one of my ten. And someone from paradise will become one of yours. And good deeds will spread out like ripples from a pebble in a pond. That's why I think you should donate to the Paradise is Strong Fire Relief GoFundMe at gofundme.com slash paradise is strong dash fire dash relief. Other Star Trek fan films. I was going through this last week, or tail, beginning of this week. Last, tail end of last week, beginning of this one. I was going through and looking at fan films because, you know, I've been wanting to do some more reviews of fan films and just haven't gotten it worked into the schedule lately. It was one thing when I was killing myself trying to do like five shows a week. Um, it's another when you've got one show a week and you're trying to do reviews of these older films and stuff. And what I was discovering, I, did, I knew it already, but what I was discovering when I was looking through all that was that the period from about 2004 to 2016 was the golden age of Star Trek fan films. I'm hoping someday maybe there will be a Silver Age, but given the rules on Star Trek fan films, that's highly unlikely. But 2004 to 2016, golden age of fan films. Now the acting I was finding, because I've watched this, uh, I've now watched a bunch of different fan films just in the last week. The acting on them varied a lot in terms of quality and occasionally is even cringeworthy. But you do have to just forgive it. If you are coming at it as a reviewer like me, you have to forgive that because these are not professional actors. These are fans living out their dreams. You know, if, if, if I was going to make a Star Trek fan film and I decided to write myself as the captain of the starship, maybe it wouldn't be that great. But damn it, I'm going to live out my dream. So, you know, you got to forgive them. You just have to forgive them. They're living out their dreams, and you can't think of it as anything else. But beyond that, anybody who may be making a fan film, feel free to call. I'd love to do a cameo for the right part. I would come out of my 30-some year retirement to do a, uh, a good Star Trek fan film. So, But I think largely the days of the wonderful fan films are generally over. Maybe I'll find out that I'm wrong because I'm going to talk about something I'm going to do differently going forward. I always want to talk about, and specifically, Star Trek New Voyages Phase 2 because I love that show. I'm always sad that they didn't do more. Um, what they had was really awesome and getting better and better as they went along. They actually did have uh, more footage shot for other episodes, but CBS's fan film guidelines kind of killed that. Sitting out there somewhere is footage for like two more episodes. I also get the impression that maybe James Cawley got disillusioned about the whole thing after having some kind of fallout with Vic Mignogna. Unfortunately, having reviewed Star Trek New Voyages Phase 2 and Star Trek Continues, I now know too much about those productions. I and how Vic Mignogna and Colley, James Colley, came to loggerheads about something, where eventually Vic ended up releasing a non colley sanctioned version of the episode to Katumba. I do not know the specifics. I probably never will. They've never talked about it in, 
in any way that was very specific. Just certain things happened, as opposed to, you know, the real story on any of those is if you were going to sit down, and by the way, if somebody wants to pay me, somebody wants to fund me, i.e. give me the money in advance so I have the money to do it, I will be happy to fly over the United States, get with the people involved, get them good and drunk, and get them to tell me what the actual details are, what actually happened. Um, you know, the statements like, well, Vic and I were on the set of this, and Vic said this, and I said no. And, and then he got pissed and he did this. So I go to Vic and I say, well, we are on the set of this. I wanted this. He said no, and I got pissed. So I went and did this other thing. We'll never know those particular details. I wish we would. Um, yes, and some of the people, well, most of the people involved in Star Trek Continues, and a great number of them involved in uh, Star Trek New Voyages Phase 2, were professional actors, which is part of the reason that the damn thing looks so good, is acted so well, and so forth. But now knowing that something happened between the, two, between the two of them has to some extent soured me just slightly on Star Trek Continues. It is the burden of being a Fandai master. You have a show that you really love, and I do. I love Star Trek Continues, and I love Star Trek Phase Two: New Voyages, and the interactions that happen between those two people, the two principals, is such that now I have to wonder. And, and it takes away a little bit from my enjoyment of it. Um, again, if you want me, to, want me to find out the details, send me a large enough check or contact a publishing house and have them call me and say, hey, we'll give you an advance to go and do this book. But if, you, if you'll do that for me, I will go and I will write the book. I will write the uh, definitive work on exactly how some of these shows were made, how they came together, and how some of the falling out happens. But it would certainly have made me feel better as a Fendi master had Kali and uh, uh, Mignogna been able to actually work together. And I'll tell you that, that one of the dream projects that I had when they were both working on one on Continues and the other one on Phase 2. The dream project that I had was a little bit complicated, but I, I threw it at both of them at one point, not knowing that it was now impossible they had, weren't working together at all. But I had a dream project that I wanted them to do. The dream project was this. You know, they, they both made Star Trek episodes as if it was the 1960s with commercial breaks and all that. I thought, let's use the internet. This is the internet. Let's use the internet. My thinking was, what if you had a two-part episode? And what if one part of that episode was done by Phase 2 New Voyages, and the other part of the episode was done by the Star Trek Continues cast? And then you set the story up, because this is the internet. We don't have to wait a week because of having you know, constraints about when we release something, what time we have it on, etc. It's not TV. You don't have to behave as if it's TV. So let's build into the script a deal where we're going to have the first half by some group of actors. Don't care which did when we're for part, do our part one. Let's have a thing where we have the first cast in, and we build into our story that there's going to be a one-hour time frame during which they're going to do some stuff off screen and then they're going to come back and do their thing again so we release the first episode wait one hour real time and then release the second again with two different casts i thought that that would have been a kick um, again by the time that i was thinking about doing something like that and throwing it at those two guys they were probably not even on speaking terms but it was a cool, it was a project that I wish could have come through. I think that would have been very cool. I have now, I am slightly changing the focus of my regular show. Um, and that's because I looked at Starship Farragut um, over the last several days. And I should have looked a lot harder at this show um, when in the past. I should have looked a lot harder at it. And the fact that I haven't has changed my review schedule and to some extent will alter the focus of the show. In the future, I will be filling schedule holes with fan films. And I will be starting that with Starship Farragut next month. 
and I will fill any holes with that are in my schedule, and I may open up some intentionally, because I'd like to review at least once a month. So I'm going to fill any holes that I've got in my schedule with fan films, starting with Farragut uh, this month. So my show is going to focus on classic films, as they always had, fan films, and then, you know, we do things like the Orville Broad Appeals type of things. Star Trek was supposed to bring people together. Yes, and I don't know what happened back there. I can only theorize, and I dislike doing that. Um, from what I have read, it seems like maybe Vic Mignon has got something of an ego. And that may have been problematic when it came to working with, um, with James Colley. I don't know that. I don't know that for sure. I just get that distinct impression from listening to what people have said. I don't know. But yeah, it would have been cool. I think my, my project idea would have been cool, but by then there was obviously no way it was ever going to happen, sadly. Anyway, I like Starship Farragut a lot. I'm, I'm, I wish they'd done more episodes, but um, this is another one where, where Vic Mignogna was involved. Um, he directed several episodes of theirs, and the acting on this one starts out kind of iffy for the most part. But then Vic Mignogna comes in and he directs episodes. And because he's a professional actor doing professional level directing, I think he really knows how to get a good performance out of people. By the second or third episode of that series, I totally bought him. I totally bought him. Because by that time, Vic had been in and he said, this is how, you know, you need to do this. You need to do these things to, you know, bring out a little bit more emotion, a little bit more genuine performance. Uh, you know, more genuineness to your part. And when he did that, I think everybody worked really, really well together and did their best work. One of the more amusing things, if you're not familiar with it, the captain of the Starship Farragut is Captain John Carter. If you don't know, this comes from Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars series of novels. If you only associate Edgar Rice Burroughs with Tarzan, um, be aware, that wasn't his only stuff. He did boatloads of books that were set on Mars, or Barsoom, the Barsoom series, as he called it, because Barsoom was what the Martians called their own um, planet. But there's a whole series of those novels, and the, the, the protagonist is a human from Earth named John Carter. So I got a kick out of that. They took that for the name of the uh, captain. I thought that was great. By the way, all of Edgar Rice Burroughs' novels are in the public domain. You can watch, read all of these uh, novels about uh, Barsoom. He also did a series of novels about Venus. He did a series of novels about uh, things happening under the earth. A um, whole huge swaths of these things that he did. And they are now all at Project Gutenberg for free. And you can add Project Gutenberg to your e-readers e-library or e-apps e-library. So you can pull these things down and search for them right there inside of your e-reader. Or you can go out to uh, gutenberg.org and search for it. I also have a link to that. Search at, um, on my website. Go over there and look at the uh, link for today's show. And you will see that I have a link to all of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, um, novels as they appear on Project Gutenberg. Now, the first novel in this series, if you want to read it, is called A Princess of Mars, and certainly do. I would certainly suggest that you do read it. And when we get into that show that I'm going to be doing called Become a Fandai Master, unless I can think of something better or unless you think of something better, when we get into that show, one of the things I'm going to talk about is how to use Project Gutenberg to increase your knowledge as a Fandai Master. Not today's lesson. Today's lesson is a little more zen. Uh, a few of them are like that. But uh, it will be, there will be ones that focus on that. Make heavy use of Project Gutenberg. There's so much science fiction out there that's totally free. And a lot of it's very, very good. They did do a, um, you know, a, an adaptation of A Princess of Mars in 2012 called John Carter. Um, it was not a horrible movie. The problem was by that time there wasn't that much that was new in science fiction. If it had come out much earlier, you know, 10 years prior to when they did it, it might have done better at the box office. It was a technically great film, but uh, you know, it, just, it wasn't that much new. 
Um, science fiction by that time had already shown much of what we saw on the screen. In terms, of, again, of Starship uh, Farragut, it is a technically great film. Um, one of the things I get a kick out of is the fact that there's uh, an episode where they're wearing original series era jacket uniforms. The reality was they were shooting on location. Uh, it was cold or going to be chilly, so they got the customers to make them a jacket uniform. I want one of these things. <laughs> Makes people like me or a little bigger look better. So I would like to have one of these jackets. Feel free to make me one. They also did, Stars of Farragut did an animated series. They actually did at least as many animated, animated episodes, I think, as their live action ones. And they get a kick out of the animated series episodes because it looks, it is done precisely in the style of Star Trek, the original series, animated series. Um, it, it's, it's the same, you know, if, if Filmation had done more than one, this is what it would have looked like. You know, it's very, very good. Um, definitely suggest, uh, you know, you take a look at that. I like jackets. Well, when it comes to Star Trek uh, costumes, I like them <clears throat> because if I didn't, I would be that guy at the convention. The one wearing the uh, Starfleet uniform that uh, should not be worn by people who are not very thin and in shape. <laughs> But I will not talk much about this series because I'm going to save it for my reviews. Similarly, Starship Exeter. There is a really interesting one. The final episode, the second to the last episode they made, was originally shot in 2004. And the last act for it was not released until 2014. Now, they did a lot of other interesting and groundbreaking stuff with that show. Um, but it is another one that I am going to review. I wish they'd done more than two episodes. It is technically very good. The acting is not horrible. Uh, and I'll be redoing reviews of it this year. Um, there are not a ton of these two series out there, so I'm going to be able to work them in. As I say, I want to get at least once a month, but it's possible I may have holes in the schedule that I'll then fill with this. Yes, all shapes are welcome at cons. That's absolutely true. But um, I want to be the guy that maybe is, you know, 200 pounds and five foot nine, who looks a little more svelte. <laughs> maybe just that. Uh, and I, if I, I've got an original series costume that I can't fit into anymore. If you let it out to be enough so I could fit in it, it'd be one of those deals where, you know, it hangs over my stomach. And I have no problem with people showing up to cons like that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's just me personally, I'm vain enough um, that I either want to lose about 30 pounds or I want to look better, one of the two. I'm working on the former. So There are other fan films. There are many, many other fan films beyond that. I was looking them up, and one that I did not know about, which means even a fan die master, there is always more to learn. Paragon's Paragon. That is a 1974 fan film. That one was essentially, if I read it right, and I can't find a full copy of it yet, but if I read it right, Paragon's Paragon was a fan's attempt to do the book, James Blish's book, Spock Must Die, as a fan film. There are snippets of it here on YouTube you can find if you look for it, and they don't look horrible. I mean, you know, considering it was 1974, you know, the sets that he built were reasonable. The model work that he did was reasonable, considering you're talking about a fan film made in 1974 and not with small digital cameras. We're talking about big 16 millimeter rigs. So I don't know if that thing survives. I hope it does because I'd like to see it and review it. Either way, I'm going to talk about it at some point. I'll eat up a show talking about it. But it's called Paragon's Paragon from 1974. And it is an attempt because the, the novel Spock Must to Die by James Blish was relatively new at that time. It was technically the first adult-oriented science Star Trek novel to come out. I mean, you know, novels today, they come out every freaking week. Um, but back then, that was brand new. There had been one novel before, Mission to Horatius, 
uh, that uh, was released before that. It was released, I think, in 1968. But that novel was very much more aimed at children, not at adults, where uh, Spock Must Die is aimed more at adults. Um, Spock Must Die is a little bit of a different kind of uh, novel if you're not used to Star Trek. Um, it's, you know, James Blish was a, a legitimate science fiction author. Um, he novelized all of the uh, original series Star Trek episodes uh, into print. But he was also a uh, well-known, well-respected, and uh, I believe he'd won Hugo's um, science fiction author. And so his book, you know, Spock Must Die, comes off a lot more scientifically oriented than what you're used to with Star Trek. There's a lot more um, of the kind of third-person expository of what's going on in the world, and then you know, people talking to each other about what's going on scientifically and all that. It is a little bit more like a, a, a science fiction novel, more traditional science fiction novel, than it is uh, a, a, a Star Trek novel. Um, one of the things that pops out at you, for example, they, uh, they talk about um, that one of the first things that it says in a Starfleet Academy textbook is um, the biggest problem in having a space battle is joining the battle in the first place, which scientifically is absolutely right. All you have to go do to get away from somebody in a real space battle is not match their velocity. <laughs> if you go fast, if you go slow, you are not going to have a battle. You have to be close to each other in order to do that. But stuff like that is throughout. Um, they're one of the first ones. He was one of the first places I know of that picked up the notion is, hey, is the transporter killing you? <laughs> because it's breaking you down into a bajillion atoms and then reassembling you at another location. Is it really you anymore? You know, um, McCoy and Scotty have a big uh, question about that. And then, the, of course, the plot happens and makes it even more poignant. So um, when you see people now who are going on about, wait, does the transporter actually just kill you? <laughs> and it's reassembling a copy over there? Um, that was not, they are not the first ones. Look back to pre-1974. I'm not sure when that book came out. Pre-1974, that fan, that question has been asked by fans and authors since the early 1970s. Yes, Larry Larry says, making duplicates. And in fact, if we did, um, you know, what they call quantum energy teleportation today, which is going to change the world in terms of ID, but with that, you actually are creating a copy at a distance. So if you were going to do that with a human, which isn't possible, and I don't think it's going to be possible for a long time, but if you did it with a human, you would actually be making a copy of their energy state somewhere else. There would be copies. <laughs> It'd be you, the original you, and then the copy they made 200 miles away. So, yes, is it making duplicates, or is it actually teleporting you, and is there any difference if it isn't? So. Other fan films I'm going to talk about, Beyond Paragon's Paragon, Star Trek Renegades, Star Trek Dark Armada, Star Trek Hidden Frontier, Star Trek Intrepid, Star Trek Odyssey, Blood of Tiberius, uh, Potem Potemkin Productions, Star Trek in the Perkinning, I will talk about. Uh, that is uh, more of a uh, parody, um, but it's still very, very good. I've seen it. Um, and those are just the ones that come up off the top of my head when I do a look list for them. There are so many um, Star Trek and other um, fan films. I'll probably devote something to the Pink Five series of Star Wars fan films because those are so great. Um, as I say, the show is going to become about the older movies I've always reviewed smattered in with a lot of fan films, both Star Trek and otherwise. And then I'm going to be doing stuff with the Star Trek audio adventures because there are a bunch of those. Star Trek, The Continuing Mission, Star Trek Defiant, Star Trek Excelsior, Star Trek Lost Universe, and among other things, Star Trek Outpost. And those are audio adventures that people put together. Now as a big, big audio file, I can tell you I've got an ear for this. I'll be able to tell when they're doing it right, when they're doing it right. And there are some next-gen fan films. Yes, yeah, some of those are. Um, some of the ones that I mentioned, uh, Hidden Frontier, Intrepid, Odyssey, uh, I think uh, Dark Armada, but I may be wrong about that. But yeah, there's a whole slew of next-gen era ones in there as well. Absolutely. 
Uh, I'm not going to limit it to just original series, nor am I limiting it to just Star Trek. I have decided after watching some of these that I didn't give as much looking to as I did with Star Trek uh, Continues and Star Trek Phase 2. They are worth a lot of talking about, and so I'm going to talk about a lot of them. Some of them are better than others. Some of them are technically better. Some of them, again, you have to tend to forgive the acting a lot. Because these are not professionals, these are people who are living out their dreams. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.